I think we're heading toward a system of, uh, of international or global justice. Uh, um, we're not there yet, uh, and it, the, the sort of um, days that we had in the 1990s uh, when the international ad hoc courts were established and the ICC was established and when some chiefs of state and other powerful individuals were brought to account, I think gave us a lot of hope that uh, by the time we got to 2016, we'd be well on the way to an international system of justice. But uh, uh, there's been a lot of pushback, obviously, from, from leaders who, uh, who, who want to be able to preserve uh, their own power, uh, want to continue uh, impunity. And, uh, and challenges uh, in, in the fact that uh, some of the courts that had the greatest success, the, the Yugoslavia Tribunal, the Rwanda Tribunal, the Sierra Leone Tribunal, are basically closed now. I mean, there's a, a Mladic case just finishing in The Hague and a few appeals, but otherwise uh, those courts are gone and they had 30 or 40 judges working in them, making decisions on all sorts of questions, what genocide really was, uh, what uh, defining the laws of war and the laws of armed conflict in ways that they'd never been fully defined before. There were always questions for the Red Cross on whether this was a crime or that was a crime, and it's really been laid out. And then the, crime, uh, the, the whole area of crimes against humanity, uh, which came to us originally from Nuremberg, has been fleshed out enormously with, uh, with crimes like sexual slavery and, and, and the Special Court for Sierra Leone, forced marriage, uh, uh, and other horrendous uh, violent acts being recognized and, and prosecuted as crimes against humanity. That whole phase is now coming to an end, and what we have now is the, is the ICC, uh, which uh, doesn't have as much uh, sort of legal authority behind it as the ad hoc tribunals, uh, because they operated under the United Nations Charter, and their orders were binding on all states in the world. The ICC is only binding on the 124 countries that have signed up, and some of them uh, don't fully honor. Uh, their obligations, and there's really nothing that can be effectively done to them, unlike in a case of a Security Council situation where a country can be sanctioned for violating something or violating a resolution that passed the Security Council. And even when the Security Council has referred cases uh, to the ICC, uh, it hasn't uh, provided that the, the orders are binding on anything other than the Rome Statute countries and on the, the situation country. Others are simply urged to, to cooperate. Uh, and that institution has also been burdened by some very complex procedures. Uh, it has to go through basically three hearings almost before it even gets to set a case for trial. <laughs> Unlike the ad hoc tribunals, we were able to, uh, to just file an indictment application to a judge who could improve, approve it ex parte. Then if we could arrest the guy, he'd be in, plead guilty, not guilty. We'd set it for trial. In the ICC, you have to get a court order to open the case. You have to get a court order uh, for, the, uh, for the arrest warrant and a very complex procedure. And then after, even after you arrest the guy, which is very hard to do because there's, uh, there's not a lot of cooperation globally in, in those efforts, uh, you have a confirmation hearing in which the defense appears, and in several cases, at least three times at the, uh, at the uh, ICC, the prosecutors lost the case, even at the indictment phase. So uh, as a result, we've got a court that's been in business for, for now 14 years, really up and active for 12, but with, with four convictions so far, and, and really only four cases pending. And so it's not a, <laughs> I mean, there are other people that are, that are fugitive, but, but in terms of who's before the court, that's where it is now. So that's not much of a global system. Uh, what you need is, of course, that there are trials going on in other places. And, the ICC has this principle that it's a court of last resort and that it's encouraging states to prosecute their own. Uh, and, and I also think it's consistent with having other courts uh, at the intermediate level uh, that, are, that states help set up, like hybrid courts or mixed courts. Uh, we haven't done much of that since, since, the, since the Sierra Leone court uh, and the Cambodia one, but a number of those are now coming online. So as I say, they're, 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 there's not a lot of punch in the, in, the, in the global system right now. Uh, where I see sp uh, possibilities uh, is in the ways that the international tribunals have excited and activated civil society everywhere. And they're working to gather documents, uh, pu pushing for changes in laws at the domestic level. There are countries that have established their own war crimes units for third country prosecutions. Uh, there are a lot of, uh, of laws that permit victims to begin cases. And uh, in a way, uh, that kind of citizen demand 
which is easier, which is harder for uh, leaders to push back against because it's not coming in from external elements, it's coming in from below, I think, uh, with assistance of, of, of international actors, NGOs, and others who, who train and work with, uh, uh, with, uh, with, with these folks, but also provide the assistance and the legal basis for what they're doing, uh, I think that can get us, in a way, a third wave of international justice. But uh, uh, the wave is, is, has not yet uh, come close to cresting. Well, I think the, the future of international criminal law will be at the local level or as I won't necessarily call it regional, but at the mixed or hybrid level. Um, I mean, there's talk of an African regional court. I, I tend to be somewhat pessimistic that that'll come online because these courts are very expensive. And, and starting a, a court from scratch like that and getting countries to actually ratify it, none have yet. Um, I think will take a, a long time. It'll also have a broader jurisdiction than just war crimes and crimes against humanity, uh, human trafficking, terrorism, money laundering, piracy, other things, all of which are important, but obviously that means that it'll be spread very, very thin. So, um, uh, and, and, the, and the resources within the African Union, unless it receives external funding, haven't been sufficient for the African Union to support itself from dues in Africa for its other operations. So I think this is going to be a, a tough one to go with. On the other hand, I think the, the hybrid approach or, or the mixed approach, which builds on the national system, and, and national systems exist everywhere, some stronger than others, but, but you do have court buildings and you do have judges and you do have police and you've got a, a permanent structure there. Uh, what you sometimes lack is the capacity to prosecute these kinds of cases and the, the, uh, the will to do independent trials. I mean, you get uh, uh, cases where in, in some countries, uh, um, of course, they're very happy to uh, uh, punish the people maybe from a previous regime, <laughs> et cetera, and, and even deny them a fair trial, et cetera. So there's, there's a lot of will, potentially. No will, however, <laughs> to prosecute any of their, of, of their friends. Uh, and uh, getting a, a, a court that's sufficiently independent that can talk back and to the to the power the, to to power, and 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 decide cases fairly, and is robust enough in terms of its reputation and strength and the ways in which uh, judicial police and others follow its orders, uh, that it can actually build cases uh, is, is a tall order, and that's one of the advantages that one gets if you bring in internationals with international support and with uh, external government providing assistance. Uh, may not be required to do it for a long period of time. In Bosnia, for instance, a mixed court there has prosecuted uh, scores of cases uh, uh, from, the, from the crimes in the, in the, uh, were committed in, the, in Bosnia in the 1990s. The Hague, of course, the Yugoslavia tribunals prosecuted some of the big fish, but it's going after the middle fish, so to speak, and it's uh, it's brought in convictions for genocide at one twentieth the cost of uh, of the cases in the in the Hague, and it has judges from each of the communities, uh, and it had for six years international judges, but they were phased out. So I think that kind of model, which of course then strengthens the national system when they leave, they're more confident, more resourced, the reputation is stronger, all of that kind of thing. I think because it builds on something that's already there and leaves something behind uh, in the place where we naturally expect law uh, to be centered, which is in the state, uh, I think that kind of approach is, is the one that makes uh, uh, more sense uh, in terms of, of, of dealing with particularly serious cases of, of atrocity crime. Keep in mind, however, that uh, the, the challenge is that uh, hybrid courts always require the state itself to agree uh, to them, uh, usually require uh, then, uh, in the case of hybrids, uh, UN or the AU entering into an agreement. In the case of mixed courts, it may require a cooperation of donors. Uh, but, but fundamentally, if the state doesn't want it, uh, then you don't have it. At the moment, uh, in South Sudan, there's a peace agreement that provides for a hybrid court. Uh, on the other hand, the key provision in the peace agreement, which was the power sharing between uh, uh, President Kiir and Vice President uh, Machar, has broken down and Machar has been fired and, and removed. But that peace agreement that was signed last year uh, did provide that there would be a hybrid court. And it was essential to getting public support for the agreement to have a hybrid court. 
now. Now it's up to the AU to work with the authorities in, in Juba and others in civil society to get, to get this going. And of course, uh, if the government in place in Juba, led by President Kiir, don't want it to happen, it will be a challenge to actually uh, uh, set it up. I think the Burundi case uh, was um, not unexpected. You had a, a government that's been thumbing its nose at, frankly, the rest of Africa in terms of what's uh, happening there uh, with the president seeking a, a, an unconstitutional third term and, uh, and uh, a lot of violence now. It may not be yet to the ICC level, but uh, four or five hundred civilians have been killed. Uh, when I think of ICC cases, I think of thousands being killed. But, but clearly there's the danger that this could erupt at any time in, into horrendous violence. And, and Burundi is a country that has seen uh, massacres and, and crimes in the past that have, uh, that have taken truly hundreds of thousands of victims in the 70s and then again in the 90s. And so we're really concerned about that. And obviously uh, um, withdrawing from the ICC, uh, it doesn't make the IC, doesn't take the ICC out of the picture. Uh, the prosecutor has a preliminary examination. She could open a case even if Burundi leaves the court formally a year from now, and she doesn't file the case for three years. Uh, the court has jurisdiction because Burundi was a state party when the crimes were committed. Um, on the other hand, uh, passing a law and, and getting out from under the court will make it very hard to get cooperation uh, in the country. Probably would have been hard anyway. A lot of the evidence can be developed, however, by people that have left the country and by, and by people who brought evidence out, et cetera. So it's not impossible. Um, and and Burundi is obviously a, a very small country. Probably their dues to the ICC are probably only $5,000 a year or something like that. But uh, uh, South Africa, which is this, uh, the country with the second largest economy or gross national product, I think, in, 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 in Africa after Nigeria, its loss, I think, is, is, is really hard on the court. And, and given South Africa's leadership uh, on these issues, uh, the leadership of people like Richard Goldstone or Nabi Pile, who was, in fact, a judge here in Arusha, then later a judge for six years at the ICC and then High Commissioner for Human Rights, and, and, and others uh, from every community in, in South Africa. Uh, for it to withdraw, I think, is, uh, is extremely unfortunate. We hope that, uh, as, as Richard Goldstone has suggested, uh, he believes and others do that the executive can't do this on its own. Uh, and the courts in South Africa have shown uh, tremendous independence. And it may be uh, that it won't happen unless there's parliamentary approval, uh, though that could nonetheless be voted with the ANC in power if they were to make it a very strong political issue. So uh, I'm, I'm not hopeful that they'll reverse this, and, and of course it may also lead other countries uh, to, to withdraw. Uh, it won't be the end of the court. Uh, there are strong support for the court in other parts of Africa, in West Africa in particular. Uh, and of course every country in South America is a member, every country in the European Union is a member. Um, there's support from Korea, Japan, Australia, other countries in the um, Asia-Pacific area. So I, I see the court still playing a very key role, but, uh, but uh, the perception will be that uh, uh, the court, uh, um, when it takes on tough cases and goes after top leaders, uh, uh, get such pushback that it can't really afford to do that. And, and that diminishes uh, the, what I hope would be the deterrent effect that would prevent people from committing these crimes in the first place.